Welcome to Sightings to Science, using eBird to share your sightings with the scientific community. So uh, my name is Sophie Mazawida. I work as Conservation Science Coordinator for Cold Hollow to Canada. I'm based in, in Fletcher, Vermont, uh, along Route 108. And so a big thanks for coming out tonight and to all those of you who are accessing this recording after the live presentation on the uh, 20th of July, 2022. Um, we're going to dive into how you can take uh, your casual bird sightings and contribute to some really exciting community science projects that are going on worldwide. And before I launch into this, I do want to say a special thank you to the Highstead Foundation of New England for making it possible uh, to, to fund this event and to launch this series as well. So um, eBird is an offering of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and uh, you may be familiar with some of their other tools. They have developed a pretty extensive uh, set of tools for birders, including the Merlin Bird Identification app, which now has a fairly new sound identification feature as well that you may be familiar with. Uh, All About Birds and Birds of their, the World, their online databases uh, of bird information. And they're also involved in Project Feeder Watch and the Great Backyard Bird Count and all of these other initiatives. So, um, you know, really a leading authority, um, you know, at the cutting edge of helping us to identify and monitor bird populations. So tonight we will be focusing on uh, eBird, which has been around for, for quite some time, and it's become uh, one of the largest biodiversity uh, focused um, science projects running in the world. And uh, we'll see what those numbers are in just a minute. Uh, but this is what the homepage of that eBird platform looks like if you access it from a desktop or laptop computer. And uh, eBird is really focused on, on three pillars and uh, that's being collaborative. So it's based on hundreds of thousands of contributors from absolute novices to total experts contributing their bird sightings. Uh, it's accessible, meaning all of the data that's contributed is freely available to be used for research and for any bird enthusiasts, students, you name it, to be able to, to pour through and access all these different visualizations. And it's also global in scale. So if you take a look at this sighting here, it almost looks like, uh, you know, like the world lit up at night, but each one of the little yellow pinpricks here represents a bird sighting from eBird. And uh, I'm actually kind of curious about the ones that are like dotted along like ocean lines <laughs> and whether it's like, you know, people on boats, you know, who are noting their observations from the sea, but you can really see there's a uh, fairly broad global coverage of billions uh, of bird sightings. And of course, North America, um, which is where this tool was developed is really the, the big hot spot. You can see it's glowing the brightest with all the contributions there. So eBird by the numbers, uh, there have been over 69 million complete checklists submitted into the system. And there's over 10,600 species represented in eBird from around the world and a network of almost 800,000 eBirders. So that means you've either submitted a single bird sighting or dozens, hundreds of checklists. Um, and you know, we invite everyone in. We hope that there'll be a, a thriving community of eBird users in the Cold Hollow to Canada region in the coming years so that we can really uh, continue to increase our awareness of bird distribution and the timing of bird arrivals and migrations and uh, other activities throughout the area. There's a lot that you can do through the eBird platform. So number one is sharing and managing your birding activities. Uh, this is an example of somebody who's pretty active. Uh, Ian Davies, a leading birder with over 5,000 species observed. My profile, I've got like a piddly like couple of dozen bird species represented on eBird. Um, but uh, you know, some people really go for it with checklists and, uh, and you know, aiming to like really hit a huge number of species. Uh, but you can keep a personal profile there and it's just a great spot to manage, uh, you know, what birds you've encountered over time and keep track of it. Uh, you can look, you know, by year and uh, track your, your bird lists from any different region that you might want to focus on, whether worldwide scale or right down to your local county. eBird is also great for exploring locations. So you can hone in on a country, a state, a county, and populate a list of all the different birds that you would hope to encounter there, or all the ones that have been observed there in the past. Uh, and then also hone in on, on maps of hotspots, you know, publicly accessible birding locations where you might be able to go birding. 
And so these are just a couple of different screenshots from the eBird platform. I will actually go into eBird in just a minute and share that screen so that we can kind of click through together and see how you access all of these types of screens. You can also hone in and explore species within the eBird platform. So uh, here's an example with Eastern Bluebird and you can see some of the media uh, that's been shared because people will upload photos and also sound clips to their sightings. Uh, at the top right, you can see a range map. The darker the purple, the greater the frequency of Eastern Bluebird sightings in that grid location. And then on the bottom right is a zoom in of individual sightings of Eastern Bluebird. Uh, I'm not actually sure where that little screenshot was taken from, but you know, a little slice of New England, I believe. Uh, and each of those blue and red pins corresponds to an individual Eastern Bluebird sighting. And within eBird, you can go in and access more details about each of those sightings. So it can really help if there is a particular species that you're interested in, or, or maybe there's one that you think is in the area and you wanna see if it's been reported or not, you can uh, go take a look at where things are getting reported and where you might have the opportunity to fill in more information about that species range as well. eBird is also great for finding more birds. You can sign up for rare bird alerts and uh, eBird will also, based on the list of birds that you've reported, uh, give you a list of target species within your region. So, you know, say you haven't recorded a blue jay yet, it's gonna be close to the top of the list of recommendations as a common species that you could encounter in your area, uh, you know, right down to the rarities. And you can also explore the uh, almost uh, bottomless number of, you know, photos and audio clips that are getting submitted through eBird as well. So if you're looking to, hone in on search images of different birds, uh, especially in different plumages, you know, breeding and non-breeding season, um, or just see what fellow birders are reporting. You can access the Macaulay Library of images and sounds to pour through all that. So that's all accessible right through the eBird website. And uh, as I mentioned, this is also available as uh, in a mobile platform uh, with slightly different features and functionality. Um, but really, really handy for use in the field. So here's an example of some screenshots where somebody was entering details or where you could be entering details and also logging through the GPS on your phone, the exact track of your travels as you go birding and, uh, and also searching at nearby hotspots where you could go birding. And yes, all of this is uh, absolutely free. Uh, you know, the Cornell uh, Lab operates based on uh, donations and uh, collaboration with other agencies and supporters to make this all available uh, to the public so that you can get onto all of these free offerings. And there are additional paid offerings, more detailed guides to birds and training courses that you can uh, pay for as well. But we are really going to focus on the free features there. Merlin is going to be, I think, pay next year. I think we did. We were just notified that Merlin's going to be a a um, subscription after next year. We're starting next year. Oh, so, interesting. That's actually the first that I'm hearing um, that news. I think so, it was Merlin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Merlin ID. One of the Cor Cornell programs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there's, it's, you know, such a valuable resource that uh, I'm not surprised that they would be looking to charge, you know, whether it's a monthly or an annual subscription to support developing that application um, for future users. Mm -hmm. and there's certainly other, uh, you know, competing paid bird apps out there too. So hopefully it'll be a reasonable, uh, you know, monthly or annual donation to get, grant you access to that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the power of eBird for informing conservation and, and management planning. So, you know, really what eBird does is take casual birding outings uh, with the power of combining all of those observations um, from the many birders out there. Uh, you can produce really, really detailed range maps, uh, breeding bird atlases, um, and, uh, you know, other tools that can inform policy. And uh, part of what makes eBird such an amazing scientific resource is the fact that the data is freely available for download. Um, it's reviewed by experts so that it's really trusted uh, by decision makers, by policy makers. Um, and uh, just the sheer quantity and breadth of participation means that you can find some really interesting insights into bird populations, uh, I'd say across North America in particular. 
Um, you may notice there's a series of four maps in the top right of the screen here. Those are actually representing um, one product uh, of an eBird analysis. And that was trying to take a look at the location of bald eagle sightings and then deciding where would be areas with the least impact uh, for citing wind projects based on where bald eagles are occurring. And what's really powerful about eBird is that they, uh, they will basically adjust all of the sightings and observations for like the survey effort. So they look at the number of observers out there, the number of hours spent in the field. And um, there's some pretty fancy modeling that goes into being able to come up with maps like these. I found it kind of interesting in this example that uh, um, the, the three different maps actually I'll say with showing different levels of green are based on three different kind of thresholds of like sensitivity um, by eagles to wind projects. Um, so in a situation where the highest sensitivity is getting modeled where there's the least amount of green, which is screen B, um, there is a little bit of green showing up through Vermont, you know, New Hampshire and up into Northern Maine based on there being fewer bald eagle sightings up in those regions. Um, and then you see more and more showing up um, the screen down below. But it's just you know, one example uh, of the power of all this data and what we can do with it. So we're gonna dive into what it actually looks like to explore eBird in real time. And uh, through both uh, the lens of exploring by species and exploring by regions. And then we'll get into what it looks like to submit eBird sightings, what that input form is like, and, uh, and then come back in for a few more PowerPoint slides to address some common questions, some frequently asked questions about the platform. So let me just navigate over to a different screen here. All right. Um, Sarah or Larry or Jane, give me a shout. Let me know if you can see uh, the eBird website coming through at this point? Yes. It's coming through? Okay, great. So here's what eBird looks like if you are um, not currently a subscriber. So when you first land on the webpage, uh, you'll see there's a couple of green buttons that really stand out that say get started or create account that invite you to share your details. If you click, uh, on those buttons, it's just a fairly straightforward and simple sign up process um, to log on with a membership. My internet is being mightily slow at the moment. I might actually pause my video feed just to try to improve that process here so that we're not super delayed. Let's see if that helps. Thanks for your patience. All right. so. Here's the simple uh, sign up page. I know that uh, at least some of you on this call already have a login and are familiar with this process. Um, but an important thing too is that whether or not you have an account, you are able to access all of the different explore uh, features of the eBird platform. So we're gonna hit the explore button and take a look at what's available there. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you should see explore species. On the right-hand side, explore regions. And there's several different options for how you can dig into this. Um, so simplest way, if you're looking to learn about a species or maybe find sightings of a species in your region, you can type in the species name. And what you'll find is that eBird will suggest uh, the accurate name for you. So if I say, oh, I wanna learn more about the snipes that I'm hearing calling from the wet meadow across the road from my house, and I type in snipe, you're gonna see a whole series of different options um, to narrow it down. I know that it's a Wilson snipe that I hear calling. And so I'll type in that name to access that species profile. So here you'll see a bunch of featured photos, uh, conservation status. This is a species of least concern globally. And that's listed on the left underneath the bird's name an opportunity to listen to different audio recordings. And I'll share a couple of the ones here. Territorial kick, 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 kick call. Is anyone familiar with the winnowing, winnowing sound of Wilson's name as well? Yeah. 
I love how they play the frequency graph too as those sounds come through. <laughs> Ebert's, Ebert's misbehaving for me because it wants to keep on playing the sounds rather than let them stop. There we go. Um, that winnowing sound is created by the tail feathers. Movement of the tail feathers as the bird turns quickly in the air as it's moving at high speed. So uh, that's part of its breeding display. Uh, so you can take a look through information as well as sounds and a range map uh, of this bird. So here you can zoom in on North America and see in purple all the different locations uh, where this bird has been recorded, the darker the color, um, that means the more sightings there have been of that bird. Now, my favorite way to actually look up different species is actually not through this species kind of uh, screen here, unless I am actually looking for photos or uh, to look at sounds of the bird. I actually prefer to go back to that explore screen and I'll show you um, searching through species maps. So here where it says more ways to explore, and then you can click on species maps. And this actually gives you access. Oh, I have to sign in for this one. I'm going to switch over to my other screen where I'm signed in here. This is going to give you access to uh, recent sightings of that bird and you can search for your area. So I'm clicking on more ways to explore species maps. And then once again, I can enter my species name, whichever one you like really, but in this case, we'll try Wilson Snipe. And then I am going to start on this purple screen here. But as you zoom in, eBird is going to give you more and more specific sighting locations. So basically at a certain point, um, and in our case, probably when we're zoomed right in on the state, it's going to create a grid and start populating it with all the sightings of that bird. So hopefully I've gotten zoomed in enough. And another option also is that towards the top right of the screen, hopefully you can see my cursor, there is also an option to enter a place name. So I'm based in Fletcher, I could type Fletcher, Vermont and zoom in to that location. And that's usually instantly going to be popping up uh, some pins. And so each of these blue little pointers is a sighting of a snipe. And all of these blue dots mean that the sightings are at least 30 days old. Uh, if there were any red ones, that would be less than 30 days old. So I might actually have to zoom out to find more recent sightings of snipe within the region. It's actually looking like it's not a bird that's been reported um, quite recently in the area. So I need to be doing more e-birding because I've been hearing them almost daily, uh, not too far away from where I'm located. Um, now you can click on any one of these individual pointers and you'll see the date of the observation and you'll also see the name of the observer and the number of birds observed. And you can click <laughs> on that observation to pull up more details. And, and what that does is it pulls up the full checklist from that birding event. And so you can see that Wilson Snipe was one of 36 different species observed on that outing there and scroll through the whole list. If, that, uh, if this birder had included sound clips or photos of the birds, they would also be included in this checklist. And I can go back and show you an example of one that does actually include that. And notice that this checklist actually popped up in a separate window so you can still go back to your map. So let's search another one. I'm gonna look up common loon and we'll see if we can get some recent sightings here on the map. I know Larry and Jane, you said that you were recently, or was it Sarah who said that you were recently seeing loons? We um, we did, but we went away to see them. <laughs> Got it. So if you if you wanted to see loons in Vermont, uh, here's the species map and all the recent sightings up around the cold hollow to Canada region. And again, there's uh, two different colored markers that are showing up here. It's blue for um, older than 30 day sightings. And then the red sightings are within the last 30 days. And you may also notice that some of them have like a little flame uh, showing up on the inside of the marker. So like I'm looking at one that's over here in uh, Fletcher, I'm gonna zoom in towards the area of Metcalf Pond and uh, click on this little sighting here. And Metcalf Pond is something that's been labeled as a birding hotspot. That's what that little flame marker means. And uh, birding hotspots, 
they don't necessarily mean that they're particularly productive birding areas. They're just areas that somebody has nominated, one of the eBird users saying that this is an area that's publicly accessible that you can go birding at. And so um, rather than say your yard, right? So like I've added my yard as a location to eBird, but I don't want other birders showing up uh, to any time of night or day to go birding there. So I have not suggested it as a hotspot, but if I went to another local park that wasn't listed yet as a hotspot on eBird, that other people could access and share lists from and bird observations, I would suggest adding it as a hotspot. Um, so here we can see as recently as July 16th at Metcalf Pond, there was a loon sighting from Dan Crepo. And he included some images. So you can go and see that there's one loon chick that's been observed or has recently been observed on that pond. And there's some photo evidence of the loon chick with its two parents. Mm -hmm. so, so there's just a couple of examples of ways that you can uh, explore by species to get into uh, the eBird data set. You can also explore locations. So I'm gonna click back on the explore tab and go to the explore region side on this right hand side of the screen and you're invited to enter a region. You can also search national wildlife refuges, um, but, uh, but the way that this works best is actually exploring by county in Vermont. So you can search by state, you can search by county. On this particular screen, I couldn't type um, Montgomery, Vermont. It actually won't let you search at the town level, but I could type in Franklin, Vermont, and that means Franklin County. Now it's going to load information for the county. And what's going to show up on the screen here, with my mightily slow internet tonight, is a list of all the different species that have been observed in Franklin County. So you can see towards uh, the top of the sightings list, that number in green, 298. So 298 individual species observed based on 30,000 complete checklists from 1,392 birders. There are also 61 hotspots within the county. So 61 locations that have been suggested by other birders as spots to go where you can contribute a list and together monitor bird populations and contribute to knowledge of that location. So the sightings uh, as they first pop up are based on the most recently seen. Uh, so who's been submitting today? Um, you can also look at high counts uh, to see which birds have been seen the most within the county. I'm actually curious to see what pops up here. I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, so now the count, uh, so I guess what's showing up is high individual counts of these birds. So like 200 barn swallows at once, which is kind of interesting. 12 chestnut sided warblers. That would be a lot actually for a single checklist. So that's probably somebody who's covered a lot of ground and so on and so forth. Um, so what's nice about this is especially if you're newer to birding, this is giving you a list of species that you can expect in your region. Uh, and there's both the overview and what I really like also is the illustrated checklist option. Um, and so that's something that's available if you toggle that option in the top of the blue column on the left-hand side of the screen. And what that's going to do, loading, 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 is populate a list of bird species along with any photos and audio clips and also the time of year that you might expect to find them when they've been uh, reported in your region. Uh, by default, they're gonna be arranged in Taxonomic order, meaning um, the most closely related and oldest evolved birds are showing up towards the top of the list. And you can scroll all the way down towards um, the smaller songbirds, the passerines, which are towards the bottom of that list. But you can also search by species name. So we could jump to something like an American robin. Gosh, there's a lot of different robins. We're just showing up on the list there. Uh, jump down and you know see where we are with that little red dot in the you know annual cycle and you know frequency commonality of those different species. Um, cedar waxwing is right down here, uh, down on the list. You know, and we were just talking earlier tonight about uh, you know before I started this recording about cedar waxwings popping up in people's yards in the past few weeks and being somewhat nomadic. And 
here you can see really peak abundance that gets reported in early July and then dropping off towards the fall. So that's a way to explore uh, regions by searching the county and looking at the list of birds that's available. I'm gonna hit the explore button again at the very top menu and go over to exploring hotspots as well. So if you click explore hotspots, that helps you hone in on some of these birding locations that I was talking about. And in this case, you could actually type in your address, you could type in a town in the search bar. It's only in that top level explore uh, region option that you have to stick to the county name. Um, but in this case, I could either zoom in or let's hone in on say Montgomery and see what pops up as far as hotspots go. These are gonna be a little bit tricky to see on the screen, I expect, uh, but if you look in the bottom right corner of the screen, it says number of species observed and there's this color scale. So um, the, the red hotspots are gonna be the ones where the most species have been seen. And then if fewer than hundred species have been seen, then the hotspots show up as blue, different shades of blue. So there are actually a couple that are showing up in the screen around Montgomery. Um, there's McAllister Pond and Lowell. There's Hazen's Notch. Um, over the other side of Montgomery, actually with the most birds of any hotspot in the region, there's the Enosburg Town Forest that's had 348 checklists contributed from it and 100 species represented. Notice that I could uh, click on this hotspot location for more details. And you can also access bar charts uh, from that area. So you could basically come up with a list of all the different birds that you might expect. Um, and so this should look fairly familiar again. So a list of sightings that have occurred on that area. Or you can go back and you can suggest, uh, yeah, look for the, the bar charts that show you what to expect at what time of year at that location. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to explore. Any questions about anything that we've covered through all of these different explore menus so far? So far, so good? I believe it. It's great. <laughs> so yeah, lots, lots and lots of data. Um, and you know, in some ways we're just kind of scratching the surface because obviously there's treasure troves of data that you could mine through here if you want to look through people's images and recordings, uh, you know, sound recordings. Um, so I highly recommend just, you know, getting on and kind of clicking through and kind of choosing your own adventure to access some of this data. But these are, that's sort of like a little flyover of some of the key ways to explore what's here. Um, so now we're going to go on to the side of how do you submit your sightings. And one thing that I really want to emphasize is you need not be an expert birder in order to submit sightings to eBird. You just need to give an honest account of all the birds that you have seen or heard. Uh, and there's some key things that you'll report in your eBird sightings in order to be able to contribute data that can be used uh, by researchers around the world. So in order to submit, you do need to have an eBird account just as you do in order to explore the locations in detail. Uh, and so once you're logged into your account, you can hit the submit button. And then I, I will after this go over how you, or what it looks like to do this through your smartphone instead, because obviously if you do have a smartphone, um, that's something that can happen in the field while you're birding actively. Whereas this option is you know, where you'd be keeping a list in a notebook or however it is that you keep notes when you're out in the field and then you need to come back and report this information online, right? By getting onto your laptop or desktop and logging into eBird. So here's what it looks like when you log into eBird. And the first step when you hit the submit is it's going to ask you for the location. Where did you go birding today? And so you have the option of choosing. So in, in this case for me, it's showing a list of all the places where I've birded and submitted locations. Uh, into eBird, or you can find your location on a map if you're adding a new location. All right, so it's choosing from an existing location or uh, finding on the map. You can also use latitude, longitude, uh, if you happen to have taken some coordinates from where you were birding, but I find that the find it on a map tool is pretty useful. So I'm going to enter Franklin, Vermont uh, to get us started, just to take us to that county, and then it's going to open up the map for us to pick our location. And when I choose this, uh, what's actually going to come up is all of the hotspots, uh, as well as my personal locations uh, in blue from this area. 
And so you can zoom in towards these, or maybe you've birded in a location that's not a known hotspot. So you can zoom, zoom, zoom. And let's say in my case that, I don't know, here I am near LaJoy Stables. Let's say I was birding off of Pollander Road in Fletcher. So right in this area here, uh, it's just a matter of clicking to create a green marker. And then you get to, if this is a location that's never been birded in eBird before, you get to enter a location name. Uh, if you do this on your smartphone, it's going to pull your coordinates and make a suggestion of a location based on the address. Um, it can be helpful to be uh, as, as kind of accurate and broad in your descriptions, like using an address for a new location, or in this case, I could say something like Pollander Road. Um, you know, if you say something like my yard, I guess that's helpful for you, but not very much helpful for somebody else who's accessing eBird if this ends up being, um, you know, a data point or a list that somebody else takes a look at. So I could just say Pollander Road. And here's where you have the option. There's a little checkbox if you want to suggest this as a birding hotspot. So if the location that you've been birding at uh, is not yet a hotspot, but it's a spot where other birders could go, you could suggest it there. Um, I'm just putting Pollander Road broadly. It would be great to have like a specific street address if it was a particular address where I was birding. So then you hit continue. And the next thing it's gonna ask for is some details of your observation, specifically the observation date. Of course, I'm inventing this observation right now, but I'm gonna put in today's date and then the observation type. So you're asked to choose, were you traveling around a specific distance as you were birding? Were you stationary and birding at a fixed location? I was like me, I made a checklist from my yard this morning and I was just standing in one spot listening for a few minutes. Um, and then there's two other categories that hopefully you'll be using less frequently, but you can enter in historical records like, uh, and, and that could be in the case where you don't know how long you birded for and exactly how far you went, but maybe you know two years ago, you remembered that you saw or heard a rare bird or any bird at all. Um, and you just have like a general idea of the location, that's where you would type in historical. These records can't be used um, as much for some of the scientific analysis, but they can be important records anyway. And then incidental, this last category means birding was not your primary purchase or purpose. Um, so maybe you just happened to be doing something when a peregrine falcon came by and you wanted to report it to eBird. Um, and, and so in the case of an incidental sighting, that's where it means that you weren't really taking note of all the birds that were in the area, just that particular exciting one. So that's why you would choose that category. Uh, I'm going to say traveling in our case, and that's, this is probably the most frequent type of bird sighting. If you're using the eBird app on your smartphone, this is when uh, eBird would be able to automatically calculate the distance and the duration of your travels, you would just say record track as you go. But if you're coming in on the website, you have to record this after the fact. So I could say, um, you know, take a note, let's say I started at 11am this morning, I can enter in those details. I birded for 35 minutes. So these are all things that you need to take note of if you plan on entering this after the fact. And then I'm going to calculate my one way birding distance. So Say I decided to walk a length of Pollander Road and bird along the way, and then I turned around and returned to my vehicle. Um, I would only calculate that as the one-way distance from my start point to my turnaround point, rather than double counting the distance. Um, just like you know, what, when you're birding a region like that, if you do end up doubling back on your trail, you can count new birds that you see on your way back, but you wouldn't count, say, the same couple of um, you know, mallards that you saw on a pond along the way, if you'd already counted them on your way out. And then party size, so number of people in your party. So in my case, I'm going to report a solo observation. If you report that there are multiple observers, uh, you will have the option of sharing this checklist with those other observers by entering in their eBird usernames or their email addresses. Um, and that's an important thing to consider if you are out birding with other people. It's important that only one of you has your phone actively working on an eBird checklist or only one of you actually goes in and records it online after the fact um, so that only a single list is reported and those birds just get counted once. But there are some really great sharing options where you can basically uh, tag this list to your friends or have somebody else do all the work and then tag you to get credit for the list and have those birds added to your life count um, but not have to double enter it. 
here's my fabricated sighting. I'm going to hit the continue button. And here's the fun part. What did you see or hear? So there's a couple of options for arranging this list. Uh, it's starting in taxonomic order, but you could also arrange it by most likely. So there's a checkbox to the right hand side of the screen group by most likely. And it basically starts with the most common species down to the less common. And it's excluding the most rare birds from this list too. Notice on the right hand side, there's a spot where I could show rarities if I wanted really uncommon species to be showing up as well, if you had something really exciting. Um, in this case, you wanna provide as accurate account as possible. And obviously you're not gonna get absolutely everything, right? Even the best birder in an area is gonna miss something, but you just want the most accurate representation of all the birds that you saw or heard in your little birding session. So I'm making this up as I go, but maybe I noted a couple of morning doves, a northern flicker, six crows, you know, a couple of groups of crows off in the distance, a blue jay. So you can just click through and populate these numbers. Um, there is also an option to uh, put an X just to indicate that you saw some number of that bird. It's, it's always better to have a number, right? Because an X could mean one or it could mean a million. Um, but that would be like, oh, I know that I saw at least some blue jay, but I really, you know, I can't remember the number. And so in that case, you could indicate an X. There's also what's known as slashes and spurs. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll see uh, through the list here, for example, like duck species. Uh, so say you see a duck and you don't know what kind of duck it is, there's your option to just add it as a duck spur. And then there's also some slash options that you'll see as you make your way through the list. Uh, one of the ones that I sometimes find myself turning towards, and I can also search for it here, uh, is say sharp shinned or coopered hawk. So notice that there's actually an option. I just searched and jumped to the species sharp shinned slash coopers. So maybe you see this occipiter flying by and you don't get a chance to discover or you know, know definitively whether it's a sharpie or a coopers, you can put that information in there. You can also add details to any of these sightings by clicking on the add details button. And Here we go. And that should open up a screen where you can do this. Here we go. Um, and so this is something that you especially want to do for any rare species that you encounter. Uh, say you find something that's new to your area or that's very notable for your area and uncommon species. When you have the eBird app open, it'll actually show with orange and red indicators if you have a very uh, rare species uh, listed. And in this case, you'd want to put down any identifying details that you use to determine what that bird was so that somebody who's reviewing this list can feel confident in your identification. And if you have any uncertainty about it, this is also a place where you could express that too. So uh, anything that describes the bird, what it was doing. And then of course, if you do have media, uh, if you took a sound recording, if you took photos, even blurry distant photos can be better than nothing. And this would be a spot where you could, um, well, you'll have the option to add them um, subsequently on the media page. So that's what that looks like as you're entering in all these species. Um, for my case, I am of course going to delete this uh, fabricated list a little bit later on, um, but I'm gonna hit the submit button once I'm done notating all the different birds that I've seen. And then eBird will prompt you and it wants to double check, are you reporting all of the birds you saw or heard to the best of your ability? Uh, so, and that's basically asking, is this a complete bird list or not? Uh, so say I was, really only paying attention to the birds I found most exciting to me and ignoring all the robins, even though I find robins very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I ignored some of the more common species, for example, I would have to say no. Um, but really the oh, idea yeah. for eBird lists is to report everything and uh, to be able to click yes, that you are in fact submitting a complete checklist. Uh, obviously an incidental list, you know, like where you just noted a certain species is, is by nature not going to be a complete checklist. And so then you can click submit and uh, it will populate that list into the system. Once that list is populated into the system, you can then see the green button where you can add media. So if I had photos or uh, sound clips that I wanted to add, this would be the place to do it by clicking that and then just uploading those files. Um, but since this isn't an accurate list, I'm going to uh, 
click checklist tools, and then I have the option of deleting this checklist. And it will warn you that once it's deleted, it's been deleted forever. So are you really sure? Yes, I do want to delete this fake checklist. So that what, that's what eBird looks like on the submission side um, for uh, going through the website. I'm going to flip back over to my PowerPoint slides and show you what it looks like when you're using a smartphone. You'll bear with me just for a second. Here we go. Um, I do strongly recommend if, if you have a I phone, like the, the app on, mm -hmm. I strongly recommend making use of it uh, because this will make the job a whole lot easier for you. And that's because here's a few screenshots of what the app looks like. It will automatically note the date, uh, the start time, and then you have the option to enable track recording. So here it says track recording disabled on the screen, but if you enable recording, it will track your location as you bird. So it's automatically being mapped uh, and automatically calculating the distance that you're traveling. And if you're not, say you're being stationary like me in my yard this morning, uh, in that case, it will notice that. And if you don't move more than a hundred feet, it'll just get marked as a stationary list. Um, so, Here's what this looks like in the app, the, the different uh, you know, types of observation. You have that question once again, are you submitting a complete checklist? And then this is the summary screens showing some different species observed for an example sighting. Um, but what's really neat about the eBird app is that you can really quickly make your checklist as you go. So the what birds and how many uh, question, you can add observations or look up different species uh, through the app. And it's just a matter of hitting the plus button next to the name of any bird that you see to add one to the checklist. Or you can also search uh, for different species in the list. So I could type in say Canada goose and that one's gonna pop up uh, to the top of my list and I could click the little plus button. Or say I see 20 Canada geese flying overhead, I could actually type in 20 Canada goose and then when I hit the plus button, it's automatically going to add the number 20 uh, to my tally for that species. Um, this is something that I can't easily demonstrate through, uh, you know, through the computer screen, the, the mobile app version. But if you are getting out with Bridget Butler this Saturday, or uh, if you have the ability to download this, yeah, I strongly recommend playing around with it. You can also find online tutorials and demos uh, through eBird's website to show you how to use it. So I just want to address a few frequently asked questions uh, and I'll race through these and then turn to the audience to see if you have any questions uh, in addition to what's being covered here and then let you all go for the rest of the evening. So uh, number one thing, I think I touched on this already, like what if I don't know birds that well, right? We're all here representing different levels of birding experience. Um, eBird is really designed so that brand new birders or total experts can make use of it and still be contributing. And so there's a couple of tools out there. I saw some nods of appreciation at the start of the night for the um, Cornell Labs Merlin app that can help you with bird identification. So it is a great one to uh, tap into. Merlin can actually automatically uh, tag birds and add them to your eBird list if you are a user of both Merlin and eBird. So they'll talk to one another. Um, but when you find, uh, if you find a bird and if you like explore it and add it to your list through Merlin, it's not going to be added as a checklist or a sighting that's searchable by other users on eBird. So hopefully that makes sense, right? So you can basically use Merlin to add birds to your tally if you find a bird through this app and say, add it to my list. Um, but it's not going to get reported for, um, you know, scientific analysis purposes in the eBird platform. So for that reason, it is better, you know, wherever possible to report birds through eBird directly. Um, the Merlin app, for those of you who don't know it, just asks uh, three really straightforward questions. What's the size of your bird using a scale of sparrow to robin to crow to goose sized? So where does it fit in the mix? What are up to three colors that you saw in the bird and what was it doing? Or like basically where was it, right? Was it at a feeder? Was it on the ground and so on? And then it'll come up with a list of suggestions. Um, Merlin actually exists because of the billions of bird sightings that have been contributed on eBird. That's how they've been able to hone this identification tool and search through all the different images to be able to hone in on identifications. So in contributing sightings on eBird, you're actually helping uh, people to be able to identify birds better using tools like Merlin. 
there's a little zoom in on those three different questions that Merlin asks, choosing size, color, and what the bird is up to. Uh, Mer Merlin will also automatically pull your location if you have your, your phone activated and sharing a location, or you can enter in, you know, I'm in Vermont or uh, I'm in Enosburg. Uh, Merlin has an amazing sound identification tool, and you can also just explore lists of birds. So uh, in this case, this is showing the screen for uh, showing the frequency graph of a bird that's actively calling. And so Merlin will analyze that graph based on all the different recordings in its system and make a suggestion, basically populate a list of birds that, uh, that this program thinks is calling in your area based on what it's hearing. Um, you should never base your eBird records and sightings based on like, you know, just on what Merlin is telling you always need to verify independently and not just trust it because it will get things wrong. Uh, but what you can do is take a note of what different birds are being suggested by this app and then listen to what the calls are in the system, compare it to what you're hearing on the ground and hone in on an identification. You can also access All About Birds to learn more about different bird species in the Cornell Labs uh, system and listen to some of those sound clips and uh, get some identification tips. Although I will say I do also recommend good old fashioned bird field guides. I'm gonna turn on my video feed again, which will hopefully cooperate and not be too slow for me. Um, I still find myself with all of these tools out there turning to my tried and true you know, bird field guides, uh, just for the ability to flip through and populate my list of search images and mental lists, right? So I'd say that there is still a place for these field guides. Hopefully some of you have some in your, on your bookshelf as well, or take them out into the field with you. Um, they're just, you know, absolutely amazing references for getting to know what's out there. But uh, don't, uh, don't feel like you can't start contributing things on to eBird just because you're not familiar with birds that are out there already. It's just really important that you try to identify everything that you hear or see and submit that. And then just know that the next time that you go and put out a checklist and then the next time and the next time, chances are you'll be learning more as you go. And that is what Cornell Lab has reported that uh, they like run the statistics and find that, you know, birders who submit a certain number of checklists on average will be reporting more and more birds, um, basically having more productive birding sessions um, as they gain experience. There is a paid uh, tool as well called Birds of the World if you're looking for like really top tier level uh, resources on some of these bird species, you can subscribe to that. Another question that comes up is, why do these birding details really matter? Like, is it really that important to say the exact date, the exact number of species, uh, the exact location and so on, or the type of observation, right? Like, why is it important to know that I was standing still versus moving around? Um, but these details are important for the statistical models that the Cornell Lab runs. And so uh, the output of these models ends up being some pretty sophisticated maps and visual representations that you can access through eBird uh, if you click the sign up. If you go to eBird.org and rather than clicking explore or submit data, go to science, uh, you can find these really amazing visualizations of different species ranges over time. You put in the date and it's. I'm just going to turn off my video feed again so that it doesn't slow down this representation too much. So uh, in this case, what you should be seeing on repeat is a representation of wood thrush abundance uh, throughout the course of the year. So showing the flush and the, the peak abundance through kind of centered around the state of Pennsylvania uh, in the summer months and then down towards southern Mexico inter months and into Central America. So those are just some of the amazing visualizations available. Here's another vis visualization showing that wood thrush uh, core range and distribution in the breeding season. And I pulled that image straight from eBird. This is one of their flashier ones, of course, showing not just the map, but the bird as well. But I, I highly recommend hitting the science tab and um, accessing, I'll, I'll send out a link to where you can find um, these types of visualizations specifically. Uh, and you can search some of the key species that are being tracked from within our state. Another question that comes up is, how reliable is this data really if anybody can contribute sightings? 
And uh, what will actually happen is that the system will automatically flag any sightings that seem unusual. So that could be an unusual number of birds. Like I once reported seeing five peregrine falcons at once and somebody actually wrote to me and asked more about it. Uh, and there is a network of volunteer reviewers, over 1900 experts who take a look through all the data and then separate reviewers will, reviewers will go in and look through checklists as well as some of the photo and audio submissions and try to flag anything that seems inaccurate. So it could be, especially if you find a rarity that you'll be contacted by uh, somebody asking you for more information and just to make sure that you are reporting something that's accurate. So we just ask that you be as honest as possible. And of course, give as much information for those sightings as possible. So cat birds will make the list, dog birds, not so much. Yeah, he probably did. You may also wonder about sensitive species. Maybe you don't wanna reveal the location of a bird that's nesting in your area. And so eBird will actually automatically protect species like nesting owls uh, during the breeding season. And you'll see that they get marked as sensitive. And that means that when you go and search for them on the map, it's not gonna give you the exact location of that animal there. So you can rest assured that you're not gonna be revealing any sensitive locations that gets protected automatically in the system. And then the other question is, how can you provide the most scientifically valuable sightings possible through eBird? So I think I've been hitting on this so far, but submitting complete checklists, reporting everything that you can identify positively. Um, and that could include some of those like, well, duck species, or I saw a passerine species I didn't know. You can just report it as, as that. Um, include all the birds that you've seen or heard. Include the counts, the most accurate counts possible and um, adding that extra documentation for anything rare. And then the one that I haven't really talked about yet is limiting the length and duration of each of your lists. So you could imagine that a list could be five minutes long uh, from just listening in your yard, or it could be a whole day of birding. But really, if it's a whole day of birding, you're probably covering such a large region uh, and hitting on so many birds that you're losing some of the, the value of that list. Some of the value comes in the specificity of different habitats that you're at and different locations. And so the recommendation is to start a new checklist. Uh, you know, the easiest way to think of it is to start a new checklist for each time you go out birding and just, you know, limit it to a certain number of hours. But if you find that yourself like out for an extra long time, you wanna think about starting a new checklist every three hours, every five miles, every time you drive or otherwise transit to a new location, and every time you change habitat type, which I kind of think is the most interesting and maybe the trickiest one, because maybe you do a 30 minute birding session and you end up visiting a field edge and then you walk into the woods for a while and then you go to a pond. Um, the most valuable submission that you could make would actually be to divide out your bird lists from each of those habitats as you transition. So if I'm listening you know, at a field edge and then transition into the woods, I could start a new checklist, especially with the simplicity of using the eBird app as I transition into the forest. Now, if that's too cumbersome and going to keep you from adding sightings on eBird, then that's okay. You can just create a checklist for the area that you're at, um, you know, whether it's your address or the hotspot that you're visiting. Um, but do take a look at when you're visiting different hotspots because sometimes they may be divided out uh, by different areas. Or say something like, uh, you know, Central Park in New York City, there is a hotspot where you can add sightings for Central Park as a whole, but you can also zoom in and add specifically to different parts of that park, so by different habitat. So my, my suggestion, my challenge really, uh, you know, whether you're somebody who's used eBird before or not, whether you're a pro birder or almost brand new to it, is to try submitting a checklist by the end of this weekend. So maybe it's something you can do in collaboration with the outing that's going on with Bridget on Saturday, Bridget Butler, or maybe you can just take one from your yard and really all it takes is five minutes of your time, five minutes of listening or a quick walk through the woods or down the road and uh, just noting the birds that you're hearing and seeing. If you want to know more about using eBird, if this hour-long introduction wasn't enough, uh, Cornell Lab does have an eBird Essentials course that takes about a half hour uh, to go through, including some videos that orient you to some of this. But I will say that we've actually gone in a bit more detail into some of the different ways to search through the system through this presentation here. But it's a great way to recap and to link to other information on offer about how to use eBird. And that takes me to the end. So I'm going to turn my video back on so you can all see me. Hopefully that helped with some of the ease of slide sharing and all the visuals that were coming through. 
I'll open it up to the room uh, if anyone does have questions. And I also want to acknowledge that we are at the one hour mark. So if anyone has to take off, thanks so much for coming out. And uh, feel free to follow up with me by email at sophie at coldhollowtocanada.org if you have questions as well. Uh, we have a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, specifically, how do you upload um, a photo or a recording? in when you're in the field and uh, probably probably by the uh, the app. Yeah, so so far as I know, and I was looking through all the system today to look into this, there isn't yet functionality to upload a photo or an audio clip from the app. So you actually have to go onto your computer. OK, so you go that. home and then what do you do? <laughs> so you would go <laughs> home. <laughs> yeah. You, so, and so you would go to eBird.org and log into your account at eBird.eBird.org, and then uh, you would have to open up your checklist and then add media. So what I can do is actually go over to that screen to that show would be you. Great. <laughs> oh boy, my computer is being so nice and quick today, and now it's being oh so clunky today. All right, so here's an example of a quick five minute checklist. Um, and actually I can back up too, because I just, I happen to still have eBird open on my checklists. Um, but I'll show you what that looks like when you first log in and where you actually find those. Um, so, uh, which is under my eBird. So see at the top menu, there's submit, explore, and then my eBird. Okay, great. Yep, that will open up your checklist once you're logged in, or, or if you go to eBird.org and you're not logged in, it's going to prompt you to do so. Um, it's going to, you know, show you. So this is the top screen when I hit my eBird, showing species observed and complete checklists. I am not yet a prolific eBirder, although I'm feeling more and more motivated um, to fill in some of the gaps actually, because there's not a whole lot of eBird records within the Cold Hollow to Canada region. Uh, and from there, you can manage your checklists. You can see there's a couple of spots where you can access the checklists and get in there. So apologies again for the slow internet collection connection, but we're going to load up this checklist. Doo -doo -doo. All right, so here's today's checklist. And once I have this open, there's going to be a green button that says add media to the checklist. Mm -hmm. Where that was it? <laughs> Still loading on my screen here, but there oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know it was just like the blank screen. Um, so add media will huh. upload files. So I'll try clicking that and show you what it looks like. And if it is an audio recording, um, the, the best practice is to trim your audio recording. So if you recorded, say, like a minute of, uh, of audio, but only half of it really features the bird that you're trying to upload for, if you do know how to trim that file down, that takes a little bit of, of know-how with different computer programs. Um, but otherwise, I would say feel free to, to upload the full, um, the full information. Um, but here you can drag and drop uh, files from your system onto the species. So if I opened up... Uh, you know, a window and drag my sound file or drag my images over, you can drag and drop, or you can also hit the add media button next to each species that you noticed. And then it's going to open up that search window so that you can choose the location in your computer. So of course, in my case, it's opening up some like photos and media, but if I had that file in there, I'd be able to navigate to it. So does that answer your question, Jane? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, so yeah. drag, and um, drag and drop, but if it's done on your cell phone, you get home and you get into iBird, you have to download them to from your phone to photos or some other storage and then drag and drop. Yeah, exactly. So you would have to, I don't think that they're linked to like any cloud storage tools like Google Photos or Google Drive or iCloud or anything like that. So you would have to get the files onto your computer, um, however it is that you may do that, right? Whether it's connecting your phone with a cable or up uploading them to the cloud and downloading them. Uh, and, you know, hopefully, I know this is something that the Cornell Lab is working on so that through the eBird app, you can also just upload photos from the field. That would be the ideal. 
Um, but yeah, the key is to get those files onto the computer and then from there you can upload them to eBird. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Any other questions? For those of you who joined uh, the program late, I know a couple of folks came in a good 45 minutes in. Do you know that this is being recorded? So you'll be able to watch back and catch all the pieces that you missed. Thank you very much, Sophie. Yeah, you're so welcome. I hope this has been helpful. And you know, you'll see if, if my list here from this morning is any example. Again, you know, it, it doesn't take a, a huge amount of effort to just start contributing data and uh, you know, populating sightings that can be really useful for some of our range maps and so on. So I hope you all have a, a great week, a great summer of uh, birding adventures and fun time. We'll all be seeing each other's bird sightings populating on the eBird platform so that we can contribute to this important work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. You're most welcome. Have a lovely evening. And you as well, Sophie. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.